Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Today I'm speaking with Tamara Brower. Tamara is, sorry, I should ask you, are you an editor at uh, Vry Links or do you just yes. write for them? Okay, so you're- just, uh, I write and I edit, yeah. yeah. Well, Tamara writes and edits at Vry Links, which if you're not in Holland, I guess that would be kind of similar to Aereo or Colette, that kind of idea. Yeah. And Tamara also has a background in psychology and she's working at a school with, um, children with development disabilities or disorders and mm. i was actually hoping today to speak to her more on the psych end of things but yeah, i'd like to get into some of the stuff you do with right so hi tamara thanks for coming on yeah, but thank you for having me yeah so if you want to tell people like a little bit of Rylinks, like why you started that and then maybe we can go on from there into the current madness yeah um well uh used to be uh when i started twitter that i um wrote stuff especially about children um uh for a small blog uh, a small blog and um uh, i remember uh, a manifest coming out called um uh Frei links so the free left a new movement and um the point of the points we they wanted to make back then was uh, that we needed to be able to to talk about certain subjects so meaning um, it was getting very difficult for people to discuss certain topics. Um, it was getting quite extreme. People were making accusations at each other, that sort of thing. And we wanted to be, you know, a marketplace of ideas. And of course, you know, we have an idea what those ideas should be. But it, we do want to discuss them with other people. I, um, this is this became harder. Now, if you compare it to... Uh, say the US and the UK and maybe even Canada and you know other places it, it wouldn't seem as extreme um, with us as it it would, would seem in in you know the US or the UK or whatever but for us you know it was coming to be coming to be a problem so it was a sort of at first it was only one piece in a newspaper discussing why we should change that um, and that um, sort of grew into an online platform where we thought, well, if we are saying that we want to discuss these things more, maybe we should create a place where you can actually do that. You can send your stuff and we can talk about these things. Let us give a platform to people who actually want to do that. Uh, and so we did. That is two years ago. Okay. So it's very, it's very, uh, it's very young. Um, but since then, we have uh, discussed a lot of topics and um, also uh, religion in schools, that sort of thing. So secu uh, uh, a secular movement through schools, because a lot of people don't know about the Netherlands is that we have uh, we are very atheist. Yet yeah, we have a lot of uh, religious schools. And that's something we um, try to discuss. Quick question on that. Like because I know the Dutch Reformed Church was pretty heavy. Like, like France is, you know, they have laïcité and all that, but technically they're still a yeah. Catholic country. So is that something like that in the Netherlands as well, or are they officially secular? Mm, the, the, uh, no, the, what happened is it was a trade-off. Uh, it used to be that um, in, I believe, in 1918, 1920s, I have to look it up for ex uh, exactly, but uh, it, it was uh, a trade-off where they wanted to get uh, algemeen kiesrecht, so p for, vo for voting. They wanted to get a law passed. In, able in order to do that, they had to make a sort of trade-off, and the trade-off was that people could choose their schools, and, the, you know, there was a difference in the public schooling or and schools with faith-based faith schools. Um, uh, so that became law, uh, religious freedom in schools. Um, and that was okay back then, but that grew and grew and grew and nobody ever, you know, changed that. So we're very, quite a secular country, but when it comes to that law, we are not. And so, you know, you see what happened through the years is there was more segregation because the thing is with those schools, they are not obligated to except every child in their school, where public schools or uh, schools, you know, uh, secular schools are. They are um, obligated to accept every child, where religious schools are not. 
So this is it. This is a difference. And what happens is you see uh, Islamic schools, Jewish schools, uh, Catholic schools, uh, all sorts of schools. And they can, and you see a segregation there of children, which is a problem, which I consider a problem. And, you know, we want to tackle that. So um, we had an event, uh, event last year where people came to debate this topic and to talk about it. Um, and it was it was very interesting. So it got the debate rolling. It's not finished yet. It's still the problem's still there, but we're talking about it. It should that's a start if you want to change anything. Yeah, I mean, okay, obviously, like you were mentioning, all these things. Hoping, like, yeah. What's going on in Canada? In Canada, and U.S. is a little weird. Uh, like Trudeau Senior said once, you know, it's like living next to the United States is like sleeping in bed with an elephant. You know, as soon as it moves, you're going to feel it, right? And so mm. Canada is very affected by everything the U.S. does. Um, and some of our leaders sometimes, I think, have whatever envy with the United States. So if the United States has a problem, we have to have it too. And it's just like, you know, envy their, whatever their success is, why envy their problems, right? But, but like Canada and U.S. are different. U.K. and Canada are different. And, you know, I've worked, I've worked in, well, I worked in France, but I used to work for NATO. So I've been to a lot of places in continental Europe. You know, mm -hmm. gone to the UK a lot, and you can see the differences. You know, Netherlands might have m more issues in common with like Denmark than they would with Italy, right? Yeah, and yeah, so you can see those differences. But I, all the times I've been to Holland, I've never really like I noticed it in France. I noticed it in the UK. There is some tensions. Um, I mean, last time I was in Holland was about six years ago, so I don't know in the, the meantime. But it just seemed a lot more relaxed than like france or uk i mean i know that there i know the tensions you can go back to uh to no, i think on, i like... think i think you're it's not wrong to say so is i remember uh last time i did a podcast i did one with iona i said the same thing i said we have the problems that you discuss it's not like they're not there mm -hmm. but they are not well they are becoming bad in the last few weeks mm -hmm. it, they're becoming bad but it's still not on par. So like things that happen in London now, mm -hmm. they're not happening in the Netherlands. Not on that scale. It's not happening. The the thing the thing the Dutch got, got most upset about was the fact that there were so many people in one place during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest um, controversy that happened in the past few weeks. Nothing. Uh, remotely the same, like uh, what happens in London happens in London now, or what happens in 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 the US now. So we do have the problems, but on a but a much more uh, manageable scale. Still, that frightens me because that you know this is my country. What I'm used to in extremes is fairly different than what you are used to. But you know, but I you are correct. I tweeted today that um, I think that the problem is especially on Twitter with discussing policies and differences and that sort of thing that it's very hard. And the problem here is everybody lives in different countries. And so policies and the impact they have are very different. And I don't even think that every uh, state of the US is the same. So it's, you know, a country like Netherlands is not the same as say France or Italy or, or Greece. It, it doesn't work the same. People are different, but also, laws are different, policies are different, history is different. So, you know, it's 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 very. Uh, I think it's a mistake to view such a large uh, group of people, such a large, vast majority of land and people, through one lens. Yeah, it's no. a mistake to do so. Okay, yeah. When you, when you mentioned that, so I mean, okay, it's a good segue into like the, the current madness, the the grouping of people. Like that's, I guess, that I kind of because you know I, I, we message back and forth a little bit, especially about how this is affecting kids. Because that's, mm, you know, I don't mm. have kids. I have a niece. I have a nephew. The kids are like I live in Canada. Everything's socialized, so the kids today are going to be the ones looking after the policies that make sure I get my pension, right? So I want them to be educated. Mm. But like we've gone from like you know you said you shouldn't group a, a bunch of people. Oh, Canadians are polite. Americans are rude. You know. French are good, co you know, good cooks. English are awful cooks. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but that's just true. <laughs> yeah. but, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, we, there, there is like, you know, lumping like that. But it's now it's, okay, 
you're lumped by an identity that's given to you by someone else and it's decided upon by someone else and if you want you know if you want to lay claim to that identity you have to do everything that that you know like you got to fill all those boxes so Mm -hmm. we're no longer looking at you know i'm not looking at tamara i'm looking okay here's a dutch person here's a you know white dutch woman so you know she's going to think like this she's going to vote like this she's going to do this but it doesn't take into account your free will your choice to do anything your you know whatever anything like that and i mean i look at the way they're teaching kids now and they're teaching them that and that's that's what scares me like that more than anything in the education of the kid is they don't get to look at people as an individual okay there's my brown friend so he must do this there's my black friend or and she must do that right it's 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 like that well that's the the big i have two children Mm -hmm. and the biggest thing is i um I want my children to make up their own mind about stuff. So I, I usually uh, try, and I'm human, mm-hmm. so it happens, but I try to not tell them what to think, even because I'm an atheist and we we don't have religion in the house, but, it, but they do have religious friends. So my youngest daughter, one of her best friends is Muslim. Uh, he's a boy and they both played uh, football and... Um, He, I remember, once said to her, Allah had made him. And she, she is not a very, she doesn't have really, have tact yet, (laughs) I should say. So what she did. Yeah, she she's eight. So it's not, you know, back then she was seven. So so she said to him, she said, well, that's not true. And she came back home, she told the story and I said, well, uh, you know, I I agree with you. That's not true. But you could have said. You could have said that a little bit nicer. I mean, he's your friend. You don't have to lie. But, you know, I try to to at least, you know, uh, let them make up their own minds and, and try to do that, um, not spoon feed them what I believe. So I try to say, uh, I try to say not God doesn't exist. I try to say, I don't believe that, yeah. you know, but grandma does. Yeah. Grandma does believe, but mom, mama doesn't. And what they think of that. I want them to think for themselves, even when they're younger. And maybe they'll change their mind. I changed my mind when I was younger. I mean, I, I went to various stages. And when you're a teenager, that only gets worse. You you change, and you change your opinion again. And then something happens in your life and you consider, oh, well, that I, you know, you think, how could I have ever believe such a thing? You change it again. But that is a process that happens. And what seems to be, going on today is that we don't we want to steer this process we we want them to think a certain way and not change it but that, that's not how it works it's that you have to find out certain things for yourself um and i think children um are now they are trying to teach them things and teaching them how to think what to think when that process is something everybody learns for themselves along the way this is a good thing why we have school go children go outside of school, uh, of their homes go to schools so they meet different people who have different ideas which they can evaluate which they can talk about which they may disagree with or agree with that is a healthy thing but you know uh, the thing i fear most is that now my children are being taught what is right what is wrong when i want them to learn to read something or listen to something and then decide uh, what they think and why they think that and then discuss it with others and maybe they will change their mind that is what i want yeah, but uh, you know okay i mean obviously like okay, if you're talking primary school they have to start with the basics you have to teach them reading writing or arithmetic but once you get to that point yeah. it was kind of i mean I, don't, I have to remember back 40 years but it was kind of like that for me like you know read this book give us your opinion or you know obviously it's like a short story and stuff like that you know depending on you know age appropriate level right so read this mm-hmm. give us your opinion whatever you do a little book report and you write it and they would evaluate you on your spelling mistakes your grammar how you processed your thoughts and not so much on you know obviously if you were doing something on lord of the rings and you talked about spaceships they might correct you on that because there's no spaceships in lord of the rings right like okay did you actually read the book but if yeah, you actually yeah. made cogent arguments yeah you know, i remember that too yeah, yeah they wouldn't they didn't penalize you for not thinking like the teacher, but now it seems like that's what you're getting penalized. If it's, you know, the 
teacher says sun comes up in the east, even though the kid sees it going, or sorry, sun goes down in the east and the kid sees it going down in the west. He can't question the teacher. And you know, it just like regurgitate facts and regurgitate facts. And like I'm, I'm worried about the, 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 the course it's taking. Um, like I know in Canada, at least in one province, as early as 2013, they were teaching like you know, the social justice stuff, so critical race theory. They were incorporating that into curriculums, middle school, so 13-year-olds. Mm. Now in three provinces, it's kindergarten through end of high school. And the last time I checked okay. in the United States, it's 16 states where it's kindergarten through high school. Um, they're teaching, I mean, it is critical race theory. Like they're, they're teaching kids in kindergarten in New York City like this, I know for a fact. Because they're, you know, I don't know what, they, what what his title is, but the guy who's head of the school boards and all that, or school commission, um, you know, there's a meeting where there's there's a guy on stage at this conference talking to the, you know, creating a curriculum, and he's saying how being on time is acting white, and you should, you know, if, and like administrators and teachers are being told that if kids of color hand in their assignments late or they're late because of cultural differences, treat them differently. Now that's, I mean, if you're teaching this to kids, and I, I keep up bringing one thing. A friend of mine, granted, you know, it's an N of one, right, or or two. He's two kids. Uh, his wife's Asian. You know, he's white American. They live in New York City, and he wrote about this in Medium late last year. His kids came home one day and they said, "We wish we weren't half white." They were really, yeah. And I mean, they're learning that in school. They're teaching critical race theory in school, like the the, the like I said in 2013. There was it was just a couple of idiots on YouTube reading a, a textbook from the school, but they're teaching kids about power structures between races and people and stuff like that, and it's all group based. Yeah, um, the critical race theory um, in schools is something that is it's it's not really happening here yet. We have had our issues. I'm not saying there are not issues here in schools uh, which touch on these subjects there there are um but i still think there is quite a difference in what children children can still disagree with their teachers and but we're talking primary school and i think the problem most uh in the netherlands it starts in university most not necessary in primary school sure they are um because they do discuss the news mm -hmm. and national and international um and uh, usually the news is discussed and we have something called uh, Jeugdjournal. So it's the news for youth and it's every day um, on television and children can watch it. And so they discuss certain things and it can be a very simple thing for a child who won an award for uh, poetry. Say something. But it can also be something that happened in the U.S. and uh, the, the uh, protests has been happening. George Floyd has been discussed as well. So these these are things that are being discussed. Um, and um, there is a bit of opinion given, uh, but not it's, it is not the same. Uh, it, it's very banal, like racism, racism is bad. Yeah. It's very banal. It, it, it's not. Uh, so... But okay, I, that I worry about a little bit here, just because. Okay, when all this stuff started, I mean, I, I had a little bit pet theories, and then speaking with, uh, you know, Jim Lindsay and Helen, uh, speaking mm -hmm. with a couple other people, and then looking at people like like the work of like Jonathan Haidt and Christina Hoff Summers, and I just kind of put a patchwork theory of my own or a hypothesis of my own on together on this. But then someone actually did the work, and so they took New York Times, Washington Post, L.A. Times, NPR, New York Post, like five or six big newspapers and, you know, kind of both sides of the the, the aisle, I think, and more, more left-leaning. And they just mapped from 2000 till 2000, or I think till recently, like till, you know, this year or last year, how many mm -hmm. times, one was how many times the words racism, race, white supremacy, whatever, were used. Mm -hmm. And the other one, the other thing I saw were articles on these things. And in both cases, it was... It, it looked like it was an exponential curve, right? It looked like a, a COVID curve. It was just kind of flat and all of a sudden shoots up. So yeah, around up until about 2008, it was, if you're looking at number of words, it was 0.01%. So one tenth of a percent of all the words in each issue, which 
doesn't sound like a huge percentage, but if you take all the words in a New York Times issue, it's quite a lot, right? Mm. By 2008, that's you know, Obama gets elected 2008, it had more than doubled. By 2015, it had more than tripled. And that pretty much goes through for words and articles. So if the news is continuously telling you that the United States is a supremely racist place, you know, and they're, the kids are getting it through the media, and the media is, you know, they're, they're playing a CNN report or whatever. That's their, you know, this happened because of racism, and racism is bad, right? Yeah. So, like, it's good that they're not ex- explicitly giving the critical race theory, but, like, for, from my end, I'm, you know, I know it's, okay, it's not in Holland, but I'm looking at this, like, if everyone's getting the news from CNN, whatever, right? New York Times, oh, we need American news, they're going to go to those those outlets, they're respected and whatever, well-trusted. But if they've had this for 20 years in the background, and that's how they've been gearing their newsrooms, what you're getting now is so narrative-driven, like, I, you know, whatever, Trump fake news and whatever, but it is, they are giving you such a weird slant. Yeah. That, you know, with, with With children... The thing is, um, it, it, with children, it really depends on two things. So they have a home base and they have a school base. Um, I know that in the U.S. they also have homeschooling, so I, that, you know, that's a different. Uh, but they have two places where they usually are, where they get their information from and where they get the opinions from. Um, in the first years, um, first eight years, uh, home and parents are the most uh, influential thing in a child's life. But starting from about eight years on, they um, school and their peers, especially their peers, other children, become more uh, important and more influential. And so they have multiple places where they get the information from. Um, I hear a lot of people were saying, um, Especially in the in the in the Netherlands, they are seeing it as well. Their children are indoctrinated with left wing ideology, mm-hmm. um, and in the U.S. So I won't comment. I think in certain places there's they have more uh, um, they have um, they're more justified in saying this than they are in saying it here. But I also think it's very important to understand that um, children. Uh, are and especially when they get older, they are more likely to disagree with what they've been taught than people think. They they can be resilient in that. The difference is when people start um, attacking their identities. So if it's bad, for example, to think that um, black kids can be on time, what is that nonsense? That is racist. What the hell is that? Who, who came up with that oh, shit? No, no, but the, but these are the progressives, right? These are the anti-racists. That's, uh, a, that's a racist thing to say. But I, what a nonsense. I know it is, but okay. I, but okay, the average person see, hears that, but they hear anti-racist. They don't know what it means. They think, oh, I, who doesn't want to be anti-racist? Everybody wants, well, yeah, not Okay, okay. Wants but, but when you, but like, critical race theory has taken these words and they've turned them into jargon so anti-racist now means something completely different and you know yeah this is this is one of their ways to fight racism is yeah you know we have to treat those kids differently because of their culture because otherwise you're punishing them for their own culture so that's being racist right it's it's a really warped sense of the world but have they ever asked the child or the family, or that black person in particular, if that is what they are, do they then see a black person and think, well, you are black, so therefore you are a certain way. And is that not very stigmatizing? Maybe they aren't. Have you asked them? Or do you think it's unnecessary to ask them anything about themselves? Are they not an individual? You are, but they aren't. Okay, How but, but, does that work? Okay, that that's the thing, right? Like, maybe I'm going to need a psychologist or something after this because I've spent a lot of time in the last 18 months to two years reading papers, and then last, last year I've read a lot of the critical race theory books. Um, so, yeah, mm. but... Yeah. Okay, it doesn't matter what the individual does, right? If a black person says, no, 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 I haven't been oppressed, I've successful, 
you know, I'm an individual, I, I'm always on time, you've taken on whiteness, right? You, ha you have become part of the white supremacist system. You've taken on whiteness. You are no longer black. You, you are not embracing your blackness. For the same reason, Pete Buttigieg, if you look through queer theory, and people said this, this was you know, said in, like it was on, in the news, it was like NBC reported on it. He is not really gay. He's just a man I've who sleeps with... That. Okay, now, yeah. in the same sense that they're saying that, Kanye puts on a MAGA hat, Kanye is no longer black. All right? And they literally mean that. He has lost his political blackness. So he may look black, but he does not have that black identity, which is defined through critical race theory. But that's the problem, isn't it? Because uh, they made a, a, a skin color political. What do you mean, political black? Okay, so I don't, I, okay. the first time I heard that term was, uh, her name is Hannah Nicole Smith. She just won the Pulitzer Prize yeah. for the 1619 Project which, I mean, I keep saying it's a bunch of revisionist history, which it is. She even admitted that there was factual errors in it. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so she, I, I heard that from her. And it was around the time Joe Biden says, if you don't vote for me, you're not black, right? And so, okay, I'll give you an example of this. If an immigrant comes in from anywhere in Africa, right? So a black person comes in from Africa. Mm. Uh, let's say Sudan. There's still, you know, there, mm -hmm. there's, there's trouble again in Sudan. There's trouble mm -hmm. again in Uganda, either one of those places. They come here, they came here five years ago. They came in as a refugee, took some classes, started a little small business, whatever, right? They made themselves a little bit more successful. They've gone into a you know, nicer neighborhood. Their kids are starting to go to school. They're getting along. Oh, I'm not oppressed. I'm doing well. No, no. You've accepted whiteness. And even if they are being oppressed, they'll still say, even though they're, they're experiencing the systemic racism, these people aren't truly black in America. Well, that's the thing, people, because um, I used to, as a joke, we used to say that you can always recognize whatever their skin color, whatever their, mm -hmm. um, uh, no matter how they look mm -hmm. or what they say they are, you can always recognize if it's an American. <laughs> so if you say African-American, mm -hmm. usually I say, well, it's still American. Because yeah. if you, um, what I see a lot is people saying African, but African as a continent and it is big and the countries in that continent are vastly different from each other and they have vastly different ideas and religions and history and all those things and when they come they have a very different perception so they come from Africa more African than American still they hope to become more American um, but they are not accepted as such which is very interesting to me. Okay. Why? It's, it's not so much that they're not accepted as such, right? If it's, oh, well, you know, let's say George Floyd had been that Nigerian or Ugandan or whatever, you know, Sudanese immigrant I was talking about who'd just come mm. in five years ago. That would still be, see, the systemic racism. But because the, the police officer doesn't know, it's just, you know, he's white, whiteness will take on anyone who's black. So that's why, like, someone... Like Kanye, it was like when Majid Nawaz was speaking out, or was, he still speaks out against Islam, but I mean, you know, he gets called like the worst insults, or when Ayan Hirsi Ali was in, you know, the Netherlands, same thing, like, Ooh, the, yeah. you know, you know, the yeah. worst insults, right? Like Majid yeah. Nawaz being called a house Muslim, and if you look at where that term comes from, I mean, that's, it's incredibly racist. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, that's what they mean, like, it's, yes, this person might, you know, they're black, that's their skin color, so they fall into that identity. But if you don't embrace everything that goes with it, then you're shunned. You know, you're no longer black. You're no longer, you're not accepting blackness. Now, mm. someone can come from somewhere and accept blackness or whatever that's supposed to mean, but they're still, if they speak out against it or whatever, they don't, they disagree with one part of it, then, then you've lost your blackness. Then you're shunned again. Right? It's, it's, it's a really busy, like, I don't, I've read it, you know, so being black means, explain it more than I could. So being black means then that in your own community, if you can mm -hmm. call it that, your own community, people of your own skin color don't accept you if you think a certain way. So you have to deal with that ostracization. And then you have people uh, who can be racist against you. So you're being attacked from two sides. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, okay. Again, I'm. You know, this is a very American context. I mean, a little bit Canadian now too, because it's seeping into here thanks to our very woke prime minister. Um, you know, 
someone like Coleman Hughes or uh, Wilford Riley, you know, yeah, you know, John McWhorter, they get called horrible names because true, you know, yeah. they're not saying that it's systemically racist. They're not saying, you know, they're like, look, it, there's progress was made. This, this, you know, John McWhorter, especially recently, he's, I mean, the last few years, probably longer, he's speaking out against the anti-racism that comes out of critical race theory. And I was speaking to a, a few ex-Muslims yesterday and we were talking about this and I said, look, when we see in the media that when something happens to deal with Islam and, you know, and then we see the media, oh, Islam's a religion of peace. You know, this, this is 434 that says hit your wife just as means, you know, caress her or something like that. We know the media is lying. We can spot it. We can see it. I'm like, you know, think back to, okay, I on her CLA. Think back to when she was first starting out. How many ex-Muslims could you really think of that were that public? There weren't a lot speaking out. So people like John mm, Porter no. and, and, you know, all these people like who are now, because of the internet, who can get more access, are saying these things this is not true, but you're going back to the same media that you're decrying about Islam. So if you can spot it for Islam, you know, if you're an ex-Muslim or whatever, you're an atheist and you speak out about Islam and you're freaking out because the media, oh, why are you doing this? Can you just take a step back and listen to these other people talking about their lived experience, right? And what they see and, you know, they bring out statistics and all this stuff. And just step back and go, okay, maybe the media is not right. Like, you know, you'll spot it for yourself, right? But you won't spot it for someone else. Like I can, you know, when I when I read a story about Islam, I'm like, okay, that's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and yeah. whereas I mean, like John McWhorter can you know read a story about some racist incident, and he's like, no, 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 this doesn't seem right to me, you know. And if he speaks about it, all of a sudden he's an Uncle Tom, you know, he's he's a yeah. race tra- he's a race traitor, and it's just or like that awful term native informant, like whatever the hell that means. And what? A, a native? A native it, yeah, they they threw that at Majid Nawaz. Sarah Hader got it. Uh, I don't know if it means you're a native person that's informing on your own, or you're you're an informant on natives. I, I have no idea. I mean, it just, but it's like race trader or something. It's just yeah, ridiculous. That's yeah. what it is. You mean yeah? Well, um, especially on the topic of uh, because. It's true. Uh, American, uh, uh, what's happening in America is also seeping into uh, the Dutch uh, discussion mm-hmm. at the moment, and things have been happening not in the same way as it is seeping into Canadian, but that, that's to be expected. But we, you know, Dutch people are they are known to try, uh, copy America in a, in a light version. And uh, that's that's bad enough. <laughs> but the the not so great parts, because there are great parts about America. But you know, these aren't the things you really want to, you know, import. You say, um, but um, that is happening. But our biggest problem has always been discussing Islam. And what happens is, um, it's not that people are afraid to say it. For years, people have been saying it's been a problem. But the problem is that then the reaction to this is you can't say that. Well, you can, but there needs to be a discussion. And everything always sticks. There is a problem. You can't say there's a problem. But there is a problem. You can't say there's a problem. And we never get anywhere. That's that's how that goes. So, you know, um, and then people say, um, we can never say anything uh, about Islam. You have said a thousand things about Islam. Yes, but we never really discussed it. We never get past it. That's the problem. So we try to, um, especially with Freilings, we try to talk about it and say, hey, in a secular way, so people can believe, people can be religious, they can also be Muslim, and they should be free to, to do that. But there are problems that touch on, the un, on, on human rights in our country, and we need to discuss that. And I don't care what religion uh, practices, it, practices it, it is unimportant. It's human rights we're talking about. And within those human rights, within those rights we have, protecting children, protecting people, within that, you can practice your religion. But if you um, you violate some of the rights, for example, of children, then there is a problem and we're going to talk about it. And I don't care what color you are, what religion you have. It's all, it's all very unimportant information. It's just very simple. This is a country and we we uh, want to talk about human rights and children 
uh, elders, uh, teenagers, doesn't matter. Everybody's rights. And do you violate them, yes or no? And it's unimportant what your background is. You just shouldn't. And we should always defend those rights, no matter who's violating them. It's that simple. Well, I am saying it's that simple, but apparently it's not. No. That is a bit of, that's the problem. Yeah. But okay, the, just sticking with the Islam thing. And like, because again, I, I was following this for a bit. And during the refugee thing, there was a few things that came up. There was, I can't remember how many, but I don't want to say it was a huge number, but there was, you know, some number of people coming in with child brides. So you know, it was like a 25 year old with a 15 year old bride, one baby, another baby on the way. Mm. And this happened, yeah. I mean, like, okay, again, I'm taking this from news outlets like The Guardian and things like that, right? And they're talking about these people coming in. Now, what do you do there? If you haven't discussed, you know, there is a problem with child marriages in Muslim countries or anything like that, right? You're talking mm-hmm. about immigration. How do you let them come in before a refugee crisis? You, you, you haven't, you've never discussed this because you've stuck your head in the sand because you don't want to be racist. Now, when you're confronted with that, let's say, you know, 100 girls like that came in over two years. Do you separate those families and then you have a hundred teenage, you know, single teenage mothers that the state has to look after, right? Do you let them stay married and like, you know, like I said, there were some cases where there's like late twenties with like a 14 year old or like early thirties with a 14 year old or a 15 year old. It's like, what do you, if, if you haven't been able to discuss it when you're talking about immigration, cause that, you know, mm-hmm. You should be able to op- discuss these things openly. You should. And it, it, it is becoming better. We, for example, we have FGM is a problem, mm-hmm. and especially because it's not happening necessarily as much in our country. But uh, what happens is um, children are, if, during some holidays, they're being sent to uh, abroad. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, it happens and they come back and then, you know, they have, have had FGM. Now, there was... Um, an imam at a mosque in the Netherlands, and he uh, he promoted FGM, and he's being sued right at the moment because there's an um, organization called Femmes for Freedom, mm-hmm. and they uh, uh, she, the Shirin who uh, runs uh, that organization is Muslim, but she um, she sued him, and that uh, is right now going on. But uh, it's funny because that was. I think two, a few days ago, and everybody was actually talking about George Floyd. Now, of mm-hmm. course, that's a very bad thing, mm-hmm. but it didn't happen in our country. And the thing that's happening in our country, which is very important, again, nobody is mentioning, which is, it's it, it's not a news item. And and that that is something, yeah, that annoys me. That annoys me a lot. Okay. There's a lot know, of in, I, I'm not saying George Floyd is an important and you know, on, he the, is, on, but... the, yeah, on the international pages, on the international section of your news, that's something that can be discussed. But you have to have some time for your own internal news, right? It, now, yes, that's my point. Yes. Okay, so let's take something a little bit more mundane than George Floyd. Like the same weekend, like I think the weekend before, the Sunday before George Floyd was killed, there's that woman in Central Park who called the cops on, on the, she was walking her dog. I don't know if, if that story made it to the Netherlands or not. Uh, uh No. That didn't make it to the Netherlands. Okay, okay, but least... I, I have, I think I, you mean the um, she, he was, uh, she, her dog wasn't unleashed. Yeah, Is yeah, that yeah, the story yeah, that, you that, mean? Okay, that story, yeah. So, oh, okay, okay, yeah. So that didn't make it to your news, at least. No, no. Okay, no. so your news hasn't gone that far low that they're going to no, take that. Okay, no, no but, but that's what I mean. Like, but that, <laughs> but that made CNN. That made you know. I think you know it was it was all over the world because. First of all, okay, whatever you want to think about that woman, um, I'm not defending her, but. That's not something that, you know, you and I really need to know. It, it, you know, it's it, it shouldn't no, be. No, and the we news. don't get enough information to know anything about the situation. Yeah, exactly. So you're being said just enough to sort of have an opinion. Yeah. But here's the difference with this: you have CNN, and all. we have um, one news section, mm-hmm. and that's about a half an hour long. And it's in the morning. That's repeated. The same news section. So it's nothing different. It's just it's, it's literally repeat. And then at 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock, we may have a new one. And 8 o'clock at night, we may have a new one. That's it. Yeah. Nothing more. Now, you in your country, the difference is you have news all day long. 
And if you need news all day long, you have to fill it with crap like that. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's ridiculous. I think the cable news is... Cable news was good for things like the Gulf War. Cable news was good for things, you know, breaking stories that are very big, that need to go on, that need, you know, like 911 happened, you know, 9-11 happened. Cable news is good for something like that. Yeah. You know, yeah cable news sure. is not good for the OJ speed chase. Like the OJ chase was horrible. Like that, that ruined cable news. Mm. You know. <laughs> oh, OJ. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's yeah. Not what cable news is for. Yeah. Right? You know, yeah. 9-11 something like that yes that's important and i get that but yeah you know, i agree with you there and then there's you know there's cnn there's msnbc yeah um you know i'm trying to think who else uh the you know obviously fox whatever but like there's all these outlets that are regurgitating the same crap um, yeah and they're very opinionated about it as well so yeah. you have the news where you can read and um i think it's 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 um a good thing when you can try try to be as objective as these. this is what happened yeah. this is you know the, and and what i see a lot in in uh, bbc CNN is very people are very opinionated about the news and this is what you have what you get when you have an msnbc and you have a fox yeah. and they have very different opinions but the fact the fact is you are telling the news um are you the news or are you um uh, what we call a talk show, where you talk about the news and give your opinion. What is it? But it's mixed, and that is very interesting, something we don't have. If there is a major thing, like, say, 9-11, then we do have news all day. That's not different. It would be exactly the same. But when it doesn't happen, we don't. No. But, okay, the best way I've heard it described is this guy, Michael Malice. Uh, I, I've seen him. I've seen interviews and stuff with him. He has his own show. I like his Twitter because he just doesn't care. Um but he describes the news as factual, not truthful, right? So let's say there's a tragedy, 100 people got killed, or there's a tragedy, 100 people involved, you know, 70 killed, 30 survived. One news outlet might say, oh, such a huge tragedy, 70 people died. And then you, or, you know, the opposite side might say, for whatever reason, uh, this disaster happened and 30 people miraculously lived. Now, both of those things are factually correct, right? And... Like, I, this is a little bit more black and white, but they're giving their slant. One's calling it a tragedy because of what happened. The other one's saying it's a miracle, right? So the truth is somewhere in between. Like, if you're a family member of one of those 30 that lived, yes, it's a miracle. If you're but a family, it's still an opinion. Yeah, yeah it's, it's still, still an, an opinion, opinion no, 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 But that's what I'm saying. But th that's the way yeah. the news is being done now. It's not, you know, um, they're, you know, it, out of every 10, like, again, crime statistics of George Floyd, out of every 10,000 interactions with the police last year three black men were killed out of every 10,000 interactions with police last year four white people were killed now that's a per capita statistic now you can give the statistic for okay uh 50 percent of the popular uh, you know 50 percent of the people shot by the cops were white and you know 25 percent were black but blacks only make up 13 percent of the population so that's over representation like you, you know you can mm. But you don't have you don't give the full story. It's like okay, well, there's too many too much police in black neighborhoods. All right, and that's you know that's because of white supremacy. Okay, how about you go back twenty thirty years when black mayors and black police chiefs, and or whatever, forget black, but like mayor like for mayors and police chiefs from these cities that were normally Democrat, were begging for more police. Right, it so it's they just give the facts like. Just give the facts in the way they want to to show them without having to be truthful, without having to tell the truth. Well, it, what what it is is um, what I've noticed about police brutality and the difference between how many people are black who are being killed, how many people are white who are being killed. The thing is, they're both being killed. Yeah. But all of a sudden, only thing we talk about is how much of either group is being killed. Nobody sits there and says, hmm, but you know what's interesting? You know what it all has in common? They're both being killed. Maybe, just maybe, you have a common goal and this discussion is is not as relevant as you think. Maybe you should work together and talk about on a, on a state level, because as I have understood this um, in America, it's the thing where you, the state you can has more power uh, you yeah, can correct me if I'm wrong there, in this. There's, there's states' rights and there's uh, federal rights. Yeah. Like, the federal government 
like education when the federal government got into you know things like title nine and stuff like that or there's a thing called title one schools which are schools in low-income areas mm. that was federal regulations but education is supposed to be the purview of the state so the police and things like that these are you know there's municipal levels so there's a very clear separation of powers so in yeah in things yeah. like so yeah. like for like opening up with covid that is a state right and the state gets to do it right so it's Trump can't say the states are going to open up tomorrow if the governor doesn't want to open up. Exactly, that's oh, my point. Okay. Is it the same thing with um, with um, uh, police departments and um, you know uh, policies um, surrounding uh, you yeah, know about that so. topic? Yeah, okay, like okay, there's there's, yeah. there's state for state police. That's definitely true. For municipal police, I think the municipalities have some jurisdiction on what policies and what procedures and stuff can go into police. But yeah, that's mm -hmm. a very state level thing. So yeah, you know. There's that, but I mean, okay, the, the, yeah, that was I was mentioning that yesterday. Like again, the thing I mentioned about the news, the way they'd done the news for so long, yeah. if instead of just focusing on every time the police killed a black man, right, they focused on every time the police egregiously killed anybody, so that you could say, look, there's a problem with policing. There's not a problem with racism in the police. There's a problem with policing. And that would be a much easier story to sell because you have a lot more evidence and a lot more data to show people, right? Now you get into the stupid peripheral fight of whether more black people or more white people get killed, which doesn't, like, it doesn't matter. The problem is policing. So Yeah, because people have been saying, oh, you know, uh, more uh, white people are being killed. It's irrelevant. It's completely yeah. irrelevant. I understand why you want to say it because, you know, narrative right now is Black Lives Matter. But in the end of the, the, end of the day, it doesn't really matter. It, say that it's true. More white people are being killed. OK, it's still a problem. So you should therefore think, well, it's a good thing that is being addressed. No. Yeah. So join forces then. Join and talk about. And, and I don't mean the extremes because there are extremes on both sides, but there are plenty of people who see police brutality and who want to do something about it in a reasonable way. They do exist. It's just we focus only. It's like the, the, the annoying kid in class. Mm -hmm. So you have 30 children and three of them are absolute shits. And um, what happens is all the focus goes to three children and not to the rest. Now, of course, you should pay attention to the three because they can influence the rest. But it, it, if you you leave them and you don't give them any attention, then 27 children, their results will slowly go down and down and down and down. So you have to pay attention to them. And maybe they have something interesting to say. Maybe it's a good thing that you only give attention to those 27 you know, that's yeah. and I think that's the same with the extremes. You shouldn't ignore them completely because, you know, they're lunatics. But, you know, you you should not just ignore a lunatic, but um, you should ignore the. Yeah, you should not ignore the people with something to say either. And I think this is often is the problem that they are. You, they are but they are boring. You know, they, I think that's the problem. They are boring. And therefore, nobody wants to talk about them because they have reasonable ideas, and then you have nothing to talk about over dinner, or you know. But okay, but again, like you said, you know, we shouldn't give in. We shouldn't listen to lunatics. But now, I'll bring it. Like I want to bring it back to to the for Europe for a second. But in the states, right? So Minneapolis, the city council said we're gonna, the you know, we're gonna yeah. defund and uh, demolish the police and create a new system. And then they they're saying that they're gonna do this now. That yeah. was one of the. That's one of the things that Black Lives Matter wants is defunding the police. Right now, it might not be every single member, and it might not be every because it's it's kind of cellular. So like Black Lives Matter. Yeah, because I wanted to ask because Black Lives Matter is is like Antifa, uh, Antifa right? So more, it's different in different states. Like every state has a different faction or something, yeah, and yes. they also but, seem to have different demands and ideas. Yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, like I said, but it's they do also have like Antifa doesn't have an overarching national organization. Black Lives Matter does. But it's not mm, like okay. each group is beholden to the national organization. But, but yeah, it, it is cellular. But what I'm saying is like because this narrative came in through the the press, and that, you mm. know, it's it's in the air. We've been uh, systemic racism. The police are racist. Black men are black people are getting killed every day. Okay, last year nine unarmed black men were killed. That's not a black person every day, right? And an unarmed black man is not being killed every day. You know, I, like but yeah. the, the, but that's what they're saying. So the so now in Minneapolis. 
oh, well, we'll because of all this and like, OK, this makes sense. May, I don't know. For whatever reason, they're going to defund the police. Now they're going to you know, dismantle. Yeah, the that's police. going to be exhausting. Yeah. OK. But so now the average person, the average normal person who doesn't want to go to the extreme is seeing this and saying, hold on a minute. So you're accepting that we're all racist or whatever, like, you know, like it, it, that's going to push more people towards the overcorrection. So when I look at mm-hmm. like someone like Orban and I'm not, you know, I, I don't know enough about Dutch politics. I don't consider Geert Wilders like an Orban. Maybe he is, but I don't think he is. But, you know, like, you're, are you seeing like that kind of overcorrection in, in the Netherlands? People are going more right. They're going to go further. Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah. Let's let's put it this way. The chances that we, the Netherlands, will have a left, and for us, left is because yeah. every country is there. Yeah. You know, we are more to the left anyway. Yeah. So, but the the chances of us having a left um, government mm-hmm. uh, next election are is very small, very small, and they are getting slimmer. By and and that hurts me because you know uh, there are quite a few um, I think uh, Americans or Northern Americans who would who would like label me a socialist, I wouldn't, but they probably would, you know, in, in comparison, I would cons- uh, call myself a social liberal. And then seeing that, let's put it this way, the European far right scares me a thousand times more than the American far right. And yours have guns. Yeah, okay, no, but but here's the thing, like, I've, I've said it since I came back from overseas, I don't like you know, the far right, the far left scares me, but the overcorrection from the far right terrifies me. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I, I look at what's happening in the States, like that autonomous zone that they built in Seattle and things like that. And I, I think of the Weimar Republic. I think of like, you know, fascist Spain. You know, like if you look at the rise of these things, oh, Antifa yeah. fought fascism. Yeah. Look where that got you. Look what that fight got you. And, and, well, and, yeah. Okay. And it's not so much that I, it's, I don't want to fight fascists. The way you fight fascists creates more fascists and it turns people who normally wouldn't be bothered with it into fascists because it's sympath- that you gain them sympathy. And it just, I mean, I'm scared. I'm scared about that more than anything else. Yeah, the, the fascism and anarchy both yeah. are a communism as well, yeah. but they are uh, absolutely something you do not want. And it doesn't really matter. You don't want any of them. No. It's not like, oh, I'd rather have, because that's usually the question, isn't it? It's like, Would you rather have um, a, a Christianity over Islam? I don't want any of them. How? <laughs> why do I have to choose at all? This is a ridiculous. I don't want to choose between anarchy, fascism and communism. I don't want any of them. They all should go away. I don't want to choose between those, but it is what the thing is. If you uh, you attack identities, if that becomes the fight, the fight for identities, the largest identity will win. That's the best armed the identity simple. will win. <laughs> well, yeah, but usually, you know, that that is how it works. And I, I, I realize we have come a long way, but not so much that we won't go back. The Dutch... They will, you know, you have seen, uh, I don't know if you've uh, ever heard of him, but we have Jerry Baudin. He is on the right and, you know, he's a, fo- a protest voice, people call him. Well, I, I call him an extremist, but um, saying that I'm usually, I am, you know, probably labeled as an extreme leftist for saying so. So yes, it, it works both ways. Yeah. It works both ways. Um, you can be called a Nazi very easily and you'll be called a leftist very easily. Uh, I'm not, but, you know, that's just how it works. And I, I see what is happening. And have you seen in Poland what is happening in Poland at the moment? Things are being turned back. Orban in Hungary, you know, but people are happy with him because he stopped immigration. Yeah. Okay, great. And what did he do for the rest? He defunded a lot in the universities. He uh, He's very religious minded. I don't want this in my country. I don't want to take a step back. The overcorrection is what I fear most. And the overcorrection will be from the right. And yeah, I fear that a lot, especially in Europe, but also in my country. I, I I'm a very liberal minded person and far right people are absolutely not liberty minded at all. Yeah. I mean, I, like I've given up on left and right. I mean, I still use the terms cause you, we don't have anything better, but 
like for a while now, I've been saying, you know, left, right, liberal, conservative have lost all meaning. And they mean something different in the U.S., in Canada, in the U.K., and in you know, Europe. I mean, it just, it's, so I was like, you're either an authoritarian or you're libertarian. And I don't mean libertarian in the sense of, you know, like the libertarian party in, in the U.S., like, you know, enlightenment values, right? I was joking around saying I'm an enlightenmentarian. I want enlightenment values. So it's, mm. it, I think we need to get to that. Like, list your first principles. List what you want. Find the party or whatever that goes along with that. And forget these nice sounding names like, you know, the Green Party or, you know, Labor or whatever. Just, you know, we are the party of this. And, like, we are the party of the Enlightenment. And just lay out your plan. Um, I mean, I think it's very easy to call your uh, party yeah. something. Yeah. Give it a very nice name, yeah. and then this is it's 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 a great trick. Yeah. Give your uh, give it a nice name, but what are your policies? Yeah. And your policies sometimes don't match what you present to be. Yeah. Uh, that's my problem. If if it was policy wise, um, it would be very easy, and I would look and I would think, oh, if you present yourself as exactly what I should vote for. But in 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 reality, it we, really it really but, doesn't. Okay, you never. I mean, if you find the party that is a hundred percent along with your policies, I mean, that's that's that, impossible. Yeah, but you know, you go if you look at if you know the policies or at least the the lens in which that party will look at something. Like you know, you don't have to know the exact policy, right? If they give mm-hmm. you the lens, like okay, we're gonna look at it through reason and debate. You know, like they they list it out and they they stick to that. Whereas another one's like, oh, we'll we'll look at you know, one will have a viewpoint epistemology the other one will have like a traditional you know follow the scientific method right follow the method of reason you're like well i don't know about the viewpoint thing and like if that's the lens you're going to use like how are they like i'll give you an example in canada now every single policy that the government puts out has to have a gender-based analysis to it and i'm talking about every policy so like the the forestry department if they're doing a policy on logging has to have a gender-based analysis if the fisheries department is doing a, a policy on fishing like overfishing, gender-based analysis. Why? Because we are a woke country and we have a ministry of diversity, inclusion, and youth, and their mandate is to make sure that every single policy by every single department and every single government organization has gender-based analysis plus attached to it. Their other One of their other mandates is to create an anti-black racism secretariat. Uh, uh, uh. Critical. Okay, <laughs> we've got critical race theory and intersectionality in our government. You know, you talk about secular and separation of church and state like people always talk about yeah. that yeah fine we might have church and state but we don't have dogma in state anymore we have dogma in our government yeah well that's it's a difference because you know it's true secular is, is is really focused on religion and keeping that out it's very different what i would prefer to see is people uh basing their um policies on on studies and science, replicated studies and science. Let me be more specific, because these days you can do one shit study with an N3, and then, ooh, you look at that. Wine is very good for you. Yeah, we won't discuss oh. the Lancet. Oh, no, no, <laughs> please. But, you know, and um, I, I think it's important to 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 look at what is being uh, researched and think, okay, does this work? So evidence-based yeah policies evidence-based policies what works and you always have to because you you know certain things in science um science says certain things but you always have to think of the moral implications as well so i do think that's important but um right now it's too easy for people to do research something comes out so one one study and that is policy based and you see that a lot with uh things coming out of psychology which is something that's yeah. that's my trait, and then um, you see something happen, and and a few years later, we do a few more studies, and we find out that actually no, it's the complete opposite. But in the meantime, there have been so many years of new um, amendments, new laws, new things, new policies, not everything based on what we researched back then, based on two or one study or two studies, and um, it's very. Uh, critical race theory is a lot of auto ethnographies a lot of diaries yeah. and that's what you are basing your 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 policies on it is it's, it's hurting <laughs> hurting my head no 
it's horrible. Don't do that at all. And I, I understand sometimes it is important to look at your demographics, look at males and females. And, you know, in a policy, you have to think about certain things. They health care. It is mm. important to think about certain things. But it, does it need to be in everything? You know, and what is what are the implications? So what does it mean? Because you tell me this and I think, OK, what would that be like in 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 reality How, what would that I, I, I don't know i don't, I don't know what a, i don't know what a gender-based policy for fisheries would look like unless okay let's say they're they're working labor and fisheries together and they say okay you know mm. what canada has 51 percent women yeah you need to have 51 percent you know female fishermen like our female fishers like uh, you know like women fishing now what if 51 percent right. of your you know what if you can't get 51 percent women on your fishing boats are you going to be penalized by the government because you're not? I mean, like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how this works. I'm trying to figure that out in my head. Like, I, I can understand saying, okay, let's push more women to go into fishing. But I'm just like, why don't we just push more people who want to go into fishing into fishing? Like, a woman who might not want to go into fishing, why try to steer her that way? Because, you know, oh, she doesn't know what else she wants to do. Let's just throw her in her fishing because we need more women in fishing. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Like, you know, no, but no. That, that's where that's where this stuff is coming from. Like, it's they're, you know, they're like I said, it's dogma and state, and I, you know, I, I don't want to get it. Like, I, I don't want to start a whole going into what intersectionality and all that is. I've just done too much of that lately. Um, but yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. but but is is in Canada because I'm interested. Is in Canada is is your um, do you also have provinces? Is that different, or are you very much also one country, one state, one okay, policy? Well, we we, we do have country, separation. Or... We we have separation of uh, powers, um, but it's oh. not as defined as in um, in the states. Mm. Um, so we are a confederation, just like the states, right? Um, uh, sorry, there are states are federal republic. We are a confederation of provinces. I mean, it was just. Um, yeah. So provincial rights, you know, but like some of them are shared, like immigration goes between province and federal government. Quebec is a special case. They 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 apply a lot more of the provincial rights than the other provinces do. Like our taxation system, normally you fill out one tax form and in that you have a page for your province. In Quebec, it's one tax form for provincial, one tax form for federal. And so right. every other province you send it all to the federal government and then they pay the province in Quebec. The province takes it themselves. It's, it's really bizarre or something. Yeah. It's, it's so, yeah, I mean, it's right. okay. But yeah, yeah. that's different. <laughs> no, but okay. But if that, if the, if it's federal labor law, it applies all over the place and it's just, you know, provincial law can't contravene federal law, but then you, like, you know, the U S has, everyone has a, you know, whatever your constitution, your bill of rights, we have our charter of rights and freedoms. But in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, we have this section where it's called, people call it the Nonwithstanding Clause, or Notwithstanding Clause, and if you apply that clause to the the starting of the Charter, which is all your individual freedoms, those rights are no longer applicable for five years because a government mandate is five years. So every single law that Quebec passed in the 80s and part of the 90s has that law, has Section 33 or the Notwithstanding Clause applied to it. So even if it's contramanding the, the charter of rights uh, nothing you can do because notwithstanding that that section we're passing this law mm-hmm. so our 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 like i like our government system is a little weird it, it, it's, it's like the uk parliamentary system right and i don't know like the uk like how they break it down from federal to like state or provincial levels like i, I don't know what they call that like uh you know i like i have no idea like in switzerland's cantons or whatever i don't know what it is in the uk but um, so yeah, I mean, the, well, they have provincial and they have uh, constituencies, I believe, uh, between that. It's the same as with us, actually, with the Dutch. They also have uh, we call gemeens, so different places in a province, different sections, and then they have the province, and then they have the national. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, that's it's, how it works. Yeah, it like, but yeah, we're we're basically parliamentary. But it's, I mean, but, but the problem with the parliamentary is there is no checks and balances. If you have let's say Trudeau had a majority, like he luckily is a minority, so he has to, you know, work with a lot of people. But if he had a majority, as long as he can keep his party in line, he can pass through anything he wants. There there are no checks and balances like there are in the States. We have them as well. So you can, you have parliament, Mm -hmm. but you, we call first chamber, second chamber. So the second chamber is the one where Trudeau would be. 
for example. And, uh, you know, they want to pass a law, but it still has to go through the first chamber. And that's not the same as the second one. So the one, you know, your your premise would be in. It's very different. Um, the composition of parties there is very different. We don't have a two party system at all. We have multiples. And when I say multiples, I think there need to be three, four to form a government. So you need to have those and they have different policies and they have to work together always. So and even and and don't uh, you know, I think it's better than a two um, two party system. I think it's way better. But still, it's a problem sometimes because I uh, I think we have uh, how many do we have very uh, we have a lot of parties we can vote for. And I still don't know. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, we have I don't want to get into the intricacies of different political systems, but we have. But, uh, liberal, NDP, Conservative, and Greens, like they're, they're four major parties. And then last time we had a fifth party that didn't do anything. So it's normally the Liberals or the Conservatives that win. The NDP might form a minority government with one of them. And then we also have like a, a party that's only in Quebec. They run federally, but they only run off uh, people in Quebec. They'll never win the federal election. But their whole purpose is to separate Quebec from Canada, even though they're a federal party. So... Doesn't, but it does make it easier to, if you have a party who who adheres to this critical race theory, it does make it easier for them then to uh, get this um, through government. Yeah, it does. If they have less, you know, it, it's harder. For, it would be harder to do so in my country, and it would yeah. be, for example, in yours. Now Trudeau has to work together with others, but still, um, you say you miss a check and balance. So certain ideologies like this would be easier to get through oh, oh, totally. uh, government but okay but like we do have two chambers right we have the we have the you know the the, the house the chamber of Com um, commons where the yeah laws are voted on and stuff like that legislation is passed then you have the senate which has to clear it but the problem with the senate is the senate is not elected the senate is taken from mps then appointed by the prime minister so as and it's a position for life as soon as mm -hmm. a senator i guess now some of them resign but usually if they die sitting prime minister can appoint them so you know i don't want to say luckily we had a conservative government before so they have some conservative senators in there but usually passes yeah. the senate fairly quickly yeah i'm going to yeah no worries right well i wanted to say one thing but you sent me a picture yeah that um, girl when we were t yeah we were talking about and i and i i did see it i uh, there were actually a, a lot more i believe um than the one you just sent me um and I was, I've been thinking about that for um, quite a while because uh, I knew we were going to talk about it. So I was thinking about what I'm going to, you know, because my first reaction is I'm, I'm a mother. So my first reaction was, oh, my God, that's, I would consider that abuse. Second thing I thought about, well, maybe it, it's very possible the child doesn't even know what she's holding, or what she's doing. Her mother could have just said, hold this piece up. I take a picture for Instagram and a child wouldn't know. Difference is that that picture is on the internet now and no matter how she's going to grow up and no matter what she does, that is going to be there and people are going to find it always. That's the thing about the internet. So in that sense, it's it's, it's wrong. But I think, I think what I suspect is happening is that a lot of children, parents aren't really discussing it. They're just doing this. They're giving their child something to hold up, stand there, they take a picture, and then they go on a whole rampage about how they teach their children certain things. And some may, and, you know, that's that's very worrying. But I think a lot just... They, what, but what do you call but, Yes, exactly. But, uh, that, I think that is in, in a lot of cases, especially since the children are very young. It's the same thing as you see those tweets where my eight-year-old, my yeah, seven-year-old, my 11-year-old said something, you know, very my, my uh, insightful. Picture, my thing with that picture, though, is the look on that little girl's face. Now, she looked like, I, I can't tell age with kids, she looked like she was maybe five years old. I, I don't know, like, you know, I could be wrong, but if, if the mother had said to her, or the parent, I don't know, mother, father, whatever, you know, you have privilege, this is what it means, because, you know, you know, and you'll get ahead in life, and all your friends who aren't your same skin color, they might get killed, or they might get hurt, or they might, they might get arrested, and they're not going to do as well as you because of your skin color, you have privilege, you have to know it, and makes a kid feel bad. Now, there, the other side of that was there was a video of this young black girl i think she was maybe nine or ten and she was bawling her eyes out saying you mean i'm gonna get killed because of the color of my skin 
like yeah, take, I, take. I I consider that. Uh, see, I consider that uh, whether you are doing it into is it, whether it's intentional or not, uh, intentional or not. I consider that emotional abuse. You you do. It's the same thing. What I said in the beginning. What I said to to my daughter is the way you say things. You can. I understand some parents want to warn their children for a certain thing, but it's the way you do it, and it, you know. Uh, you're old enough to know what will touch your child. And especially if you do that and you then videotape them and put it online, that I consider abuse. Because you did that, but you didn't just do that. You taped that. Yeah. But I mean, you you wanted her to cry because that would make an impact and then put it online. So your children are tools for you to show the world what you're doing. And I... I uh, okay. that that is what, but I don't like activism w mixed with children yeah, no, in no, any form. Neither do I. But I mean, like the New York Times had an article or an op-ed piece, just you know, when this with all this stuff going on, and they they said if your grandmother isn't supporting Black Lives Matter, call her out as a racist. And then you had videos of all these kids, you know, following the 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 Khmer Rouge and the Red Army tactics of calling out their parents, saying. My mom and dad are like one girl. She was like 15 years old. She's bawling her eyes out. I don't know if it's but like, my parents are so racist. I can't wait to get out of here. I, my God, they say, you know, they're not 100 percent behind Black Lives Matter. I can't believe how racist my parents are. There's they're, they're, they're filming themselves arguing with their parents, yelling at them, screaming at them, telling them that they're racist. I mean, this is not healthy for kids. It's not healthy for society. No, it isn't. And the biggest problem here is, again, that they are taping everything. Because yeah. um, teenagers, they have this thing where they turn on you. Oh, God. <laughs> and not all, not all, <laughs> but especially certain teenagers, you know, hormones come and they first person in their lives they turn on are their parents because mm -hmm. uh, there is a moment where you're the coolest person in the world you know everything if they have a question they ask you and then uh, slowly i'm experiencing this with one of my children now slowly there comes a moment where you're not that cool anymore and you are not right and in, you can say a and they say b and even if a is right and they know it's right they say b b anyway because they want to screw with you uh, because that's what they they want to challenge you and that's that's not wrong we many children have done it but the way this is happening is they are videotaping it for the world and they're laying it out so we all have had conflict within our within our families that that is not um that hasn't changed and it's not different now there's still conflict and that's in every family but the thing is usually you work that out and maybe later on you work that out. Or you can even sometimes when you set something, you can all sweep that under the rug and think, okay, we had a bad day. But these, this taping, this putting on the internet of your family dramas with, and calling your parents racist, it's a, it's a horrible thing. And they will, they will find that out later. But the thing is, it has been put out there and that they can take back. And the, and that is, I think, my biggest worry. Not that it's happening, not that you hate your parents at a certain point in your life, which you don't really, but you do, mm -hmm. and that changes when you get older and all those sort That is not the problem. The problem is putting it out there for the world, never being able to take it back. Mm -hmm. And um, and feeding it to others, because you know how that works. One does it, the other does it, and all of a sudden hundreds do it. It's the same with those stupid cinnamon challenges where oh. everybody puts, you think, why are there so many idiots who are putting, you know, a spoon of cinnamon in their mouth? But that's how it works. And it's the same with this. The same with this. Sometimes social media is great and sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's, it's horrible. Yeah. And these are, and, and critical race theory, young people and the internet and videotaping and, 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 and video society is not a good match. Oh, no. I mean, it's... Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm an information junkie. I've always said I want to know everything, but I think we treated data and information the same way we treated every other technological advancement, right? Get it faster, not get it better, not get better quality, mm, not get, get it, better yeah. at parsing it. Just get it to me mm. faster. Get it to me now. Get it to me now. Get it to me now. And we don't know what to do with it anymore. We've got so much. I mean, you know, flat earthers, no spacers, which are funny, saying space doesn't exist. Um, you know, anti-vaxxers, you know, anti-GMO, yeah. and you know, 
climate change, you know, no nuclear energy, like like all this stuff, like critical race theory. You know, you can't be racist to white people. <laughs> you know, like all this stuff. Like it's it's everywhere, and we didn't give ourselves. We shouldn't have treated data like that. We shouldn't have treated information like that. We should have worked on the technology or at least worked on the skills to let us parse it. Like I see the education not giving the kids the skills that and they've got, you know, the world in their hands with that phone. Yeah. And you know, this is the reason why I've taught my, um, my eldest child that she is not getting one until she has to, when she goes to a secondary school and she'll have to have one because yeah. I can't do anything. She needs one uh, for school, so I can't do anything about it anymore until that day. It's yeah. not happening. But, it's mean, not I, happening. I think, okay, just on this, I mean, this is, okay, people are like, oh, how can you pass laws of censorship? But I think there should be an option from service providers where the parents can say, I would like this block on, and then you can go in there and customize it for your child. And if they need to do a project on something that you've got blocked, you can open it up for them. I think... I mean, okay, you know, you're, I know it's hard to monitor everything, but if it has a generic block from the provider because the parents have demanded it for their kids, and then it's something very simple that you can go in and unblock a site that they need for a school project. I mean, if they need a smartphone, I, I, there's got to be something in there. Like, you know, there's got to be a way to get them that phone so they're not feeling But they different. do exist. Oh, yeah. Because we have a, a certain thing. But here's the worry I have with this. And this is, yeah. I um, I uh, used to help out in school library. Yeah. And I remember there was, uh, girls are getting their periods way earlier than they used to when I was that young. So, you know, they are getting older to younger. The, the, and yeah. so what she, she was in um, uh, grade seven, I I always have to think because it's different. We start counting when they're four years old. She would be 11. I don't know which that's grade about that would grade be. Or so, yeah, that's about seventh grade. Oh, right, okay. And um, she wanted a book about menstruating. Now, I'm very liberal. Mm -hmm. And I think if a, a girl, 11 years old, wants a book about this, she should be able to read about this. It's about yeah. body. It's very simple. It's very. And I remember, uh, but she. Um, uh, I remember uh, parents going, oh, should she be reading that? Um, shouldn't her parents um, decide whether she she can read that or not? And I was thinking, well, no, <laughs> I'm giving her the book. Why shouldn't I be able to give her the book? It's a very normal thing for a girl that age to 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 have to understand. And uh, the thing was, and there it goes, um, she was Muslim. And what the parents didn't, uh, it's, so it's not the parents' fault. Let me say, by, uh, let me start by saying that. But the assumption was that because she was, her parents probably wouldn't want her to read that, and so we should stop her. And the thing is, what worries me with uh, what you just suggested is, children. We, we look from our perspective. So I think I will never hold back information for my children. I will just, you know, slowly guide them in. If they want that stuff, they can get that stuff. And all, all parents are like that. And we forget sometimes children's rights in this, where they have the right to know certain things. And if it was up to their parents, they would never know. And so they need... Uh, when they get to a certain age, and with girls, for example, getting information about um, about being uh, getting on PMS, uh, about uh, about sex, um, safe sex, about STDs, about all those things. Sometimes parents don't want to give this information to their children. I am of the mind that they should be able to. Um, to get that info, despite what their parents say, I am very liberal when it comes to teenagers uh, beyond a certain age. I think they have rights as well. What I do wish would happen is that they would be taught how to look on the Internet, yeah. what to look out for, what not to do, what is dangerous, what can you do. If you actually think it's a good thing to look for that at least be mindful that these things can happen slowly teach them that because 
if you block them too much, then they become what teenagers, 15, 16, and how 15, 16 years old, those children can hide anything from you they want, anything. Oh, I, I know, okay, but look, okay, look, when I was a kid, you know, 15, 16 year old boy, for me to get porn was not an easy process, right? You know, like this is in the 80s. You couldn't buy a play a Playboy. Uh, no, at you, 50, could, at, at you wouldn't pay the other children to go in. Oh no, it's different from you, right? Age wise. Yeah, like for us, like I could have, yeah, I could have paid like a you know some kid who looked like he was eighteen to go in there and buy the magazine for me, right? But if that's I was, what like, happens. Yeah. Oh no, look, I'm just saying, I'm not saying, <laughs> yeah. it's, but at the same point too, right? If I had the money to pay a, an older kid to do that, it would be here's like ten bucks. Go get me a couple of beers. <laughs> it wouldn't be <laughs> it wouldn't be that no okay. but but i mean like but even that you know the okay growing up in quebec was different a little bit you had on i can't remember it was one night of the weekends it was either friday or saturday night this was especially in the the 80s and the early 90s they would play softcore porn on some of the french channels late at night and i might literally yeah. like softcore porn because yeah. it's the, you know, the, the, the whole french thing or whatever so yeah but no, yeah. okay, what I was saying, okay, like this was just me talking, like oh, block it, whatever. But you give the, and I understand, like a, a strict parent do it, but I can almost guarantee you that because okay, I I speak with ex-Muslims, right? I, I speak with a lot of them, and even the ones who are ex themselves, but they're not telling their parents, and these kids could be in university, yeah, but their parents still have all the control over their phone, so they get they get it outside. Right. True. And, and granted, if you put that block on your kid's phone and their friend doesn't have it, they can go on their friend's phone and search whatever they want. Right. It's if you're like, OK, you know what? I need you. We're not letting you watch this, this and this next year. If you show that, you know, you'll have more understanding or if your daughter comes to you and asks you a question and it looks like she's, you know, it's not like a little kid going, why is the sky blue? But she's asking you a serious question. OK, if you're old enough to ask that question, you should be old enough to get. A proportionate response like you don't want to go into her and give her a whole biology lecture uh, you know, lecture on how that all works and how you know like i mean you no, could, yeah, but yeah. but i mean yeah so you can and but again that yes that it depends on the parents but most i think most parents will understand okay uh, you know my daughter's whatever my son's turning this age he needs to have a little bit more freedom she needs to have a little bit more freedom and we'll respect that yes fundamentalist parents people come from more fundamentalist background well, like, okay, will and you know a a family that's fully indoctrinated, like with intersectionality and all that, will they let their kids watch something they consider problematic? Right? You know, like what will they like? They'll block stuff from their kids as well. Like they'll probably block mm -hmm. a lot more than even someone who's conservative Muslim but not ultra fun fundamentalist, right? Like someone who's super fundamentalist woke, for lack of a better term, would probably block stuff more than a christian or you know like a a moderate christian or most yeah there uh, there there are differences in how um conservative uh, even muslims are like i said in the beginning my youngest daughter her best friend is muslim and usually around dogs dogs are haram mm -hmm. and so this is a problem with one of her friends in her class she sees uh, our puppy and she goes oh no can't be anywhere near that uh but her, her her best friend isn't you know and it's not a problem it's not a problem for her parents i'm very uh, close to his mom she's a great woman and um it, it it works out fine so there are different levels in every group of people in how radical they are children uh of a certain age will get any information they want that was when, when we were younger, we didn't have the internet and we got that as well. Um, it was easier for Dutch kids because we had uh, magazines that were for targeted at our, our age group. And it was, I believe, 14, 15. And there was all kinds of talk. You could ask questions to a sexologist and that was normal. And I these days, even our society is getting more prudish every uh, year a little bit more prudish with our children like we were very free and uh, we were very young especially the dutch kids were very young uh, 14 15 very young knowing about sex and how to do it and what to watch out for and all that stuff and right now we're going all no 
So we're going to very prudish generation. So it's quite a difference with Americans. I, I always hear Americans go quite prudish about their children. And uh, uh, I do not know if that's true. That's a stereotype. Oh, no, it, it, I, it, it, I, okay. but, if you see it from the media, it is, it is ludicrous. Like they'll, they'll edit out. I'm not talking about like showing a full naked breast on you know, primetime television, but even like sometimes they'll edit out the side of the breast, but they'll show some guy getting shot in the head. <laughs> like, oh, okay. it, it is true. It's not a, because I always figured, and that's always the stereotype we had. You can show uh, incredible violence, but you can't show, you know, a nipple. No, no, which is yeah, yeah, which is ridiculous. Very. I mean, they started doing it in the late '80s, early '90s, where uh, shows starting after 10 p.m. Like they'll show they'd show like you know bare asses or something like that. Mm, you know, and yeah. th they wouldn't allow you know full on vulgarity, but you could say bitch, you know, which whatever. Like it's always, you know, they have opened up a little bit, but now they're going back the other way. Like, I mean, look at all the TV shows that are being taken off now, and you know, Gone with the Wind is gone. Yeah, um, you know, nothing yeah, and watch Gone what, with the Wind. What, but, I mean, <laughs> well, they put it back, but what they did, I, I think they put it back, but what they did. And this happened in, in the Netherlands as well with one uh, show, um, which pissed off the Dutch people. Um, but what happened is they put it back with, um, with a commentary, right? They, they uh, t um, like a, a sort of trigger warning, which if you uh, look at the science behind Twitter war of trigger, trigger warnings, warnings, yeah, is really, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily a good thing. It's not been, it's the same thing what I mean again, you know, one study, it's not been proven that giving people with actual trauma, like mm -hmm. actual trauma, because I think it's very, very harmful to um, consider everybody who uh, tr trigger warnings for people who have been through things who haven't had actual PTSS, mm -hmm. and then they need trigger warnings for that. I, you know, I have a whole opinion on that, but you know, let's yeah. move on. Um, again, those trigger warnings aren't necessarily a good thing. Then there is the thing about um, not letting people watch something and then make up their own mind. They have to be told something is bad. But the thing is, if you have to be told, then probably if you have to be told that, because if you can see mm -hmm. Gone with the Wind, you're what, what age? You're not six years old. If you ha can understand the implications of what's happening there, if you have to be told by then what to think of that movie or what's happening in that movie or what's bad and what's good, mm -hmm. then probably you're not going to agree anyway. Because if that is something that has to be told to you, they, it's bad they treat the black woman that way. Just so you know, before you're yeah, starting to watch, yeah, yeah. so you know, it's bad. It's belittling. Yeah. It's belittling. They already know that. And if they disagree, then probably your uh, disclaimer in the beginning of the movie is really not going to help. Nope. It's really not the way. I said this to some friends hey. of mine last year, last summer. Uh, he was, uh, one of them was visiting from out of town. And so a couple of us from here went out. I said, okay, imagine Amazon, right? So Kindle. So mm. and I, I took Huck Finn because it had come up in the news again. There were people who wanted to, you know, no, no, it, we have to edit it. So it says N word Jim. They actually wanted to have N word Jim instead of, I mean, whatever, I'm going to say the word. I don't care. Like, you know, the, the name of the character in the book is Nigger Jim, right? Yeah. But they, they wanted to actually have it censored to say N word Jim. Now, that that changes the whole book because that was his name. And Huck goes through the realization that this is a human being. Like, that, you know, he hears him crying one night out for his family and he's like, you know, he's he's longing to go beat his family again, and Huck comes to the realization that, you know, this guy is human just like me, and he says something along those lines. I mean, I, I read it, you know, back in high school. It's like thirty years ago, but it goes and it was, you know, he wrote it twenty years after the Civil War, and I think he was trying to say America's come out, it, it's go, getting into its adolescence, or come, you know, and it's coming to realize that everyone's the same. Like I think that's what Mark Twain was trying to say, but it was like, so to change it to N word Jim. So I I use that example, and I said, okay, what if they took Huck Finn? And they decided that that word is problematic and they put out an update for Kindle. And all of a sudden, every single Kindle in the world that did an update, if you had Huck Finn, it changed it. I mean, it's not hard to do. See, this is why I like paper books. Oh, oh, same, same here. Okay. So, <laughs> no, but, but I was just saying, imagine that. 
because Disney. But imagine that. Yeah. Well, this is what I think is the problem. I do not like people um, telling me what to read or what not to read. What is good for me or what isn't? That it, I am an adult. This is what I will figure out. And the thing which is ridiculous is that you can say horrible things without, without ever using a problematic word. Yep. And this is the point where it goes wrong. They focus on the word and they do not focus on the story or the message of what's being conveyed at all. Not that they should. It's not their business. But they don't. And what that means is you cannot solve the problems by removing the word. There is still the context of the story. Yep still there and uh it's still important and people have to see that for themselves yeah. but I mean, you okay. have to give people the opportunity to learn things for themselves yep. otherwise what we're doing but also the trigger warnings and stuff like when i was 14 or 15 if a movie came on you know yeah, my parents had their tv upstairs and we had our tv in the basement and we were watching stuff mm -hmm. If the movie said, you know, not for you know, only for mature audiences, this and that might show sexual content or whatever, we'd watch it for sure because we were fourteen year old yeah. boys and like it told us what was going to be in. It's like, and right. if you were with your yeah, and if you were with your parents, you remembered this movie. This movie was to watch. It. So I mean, it was it was we're a basic. Back. Remember the movie? Yeah, it was, it was just a big advert. Like, watch this now. You know, like, so it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we use as well. Yeah. There's violence in this movie. Good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, we've been talking for about an hour and a half now. I, if you have any last things you want to say, if you want to let people know where they can find you, if you want to talk more about uh, uh, Vrylinks or anything like that or anything else, go ahead. We uh, well, you can follow us. Um, our, um, if you want to follow Feilings, it's um, not all our uh, pieces are in uh, in English. Some are in Dutch, but it Google translates uh, fairly well. So um, we've had a few uh, foreigners um, who've uh, written something for us as well, which we have to translate and then publish, which was, has been very fun. And um, yeah, what else can I say? It's been very interesting. I like having a direct conversation about things it's something i find sometimes yeah. very difficult on twitter where i always think i can't say enough can't be clear enough can't yeah, see can. the other person i'm talking to so this is easier for me uh, yeah. and more fun yeah no but also i mean you can understand tone you can understand you know yes if, exactly. if i'm being sarcastic and i say something horrible you can pick that up right yeah whereas on twitter yeah. it's like oh my god why did you say something so so mean it's just you know except about helen's cooking you can't be mean enough about helen's cooking <laughs> you can't you really can't no but you have if you you have to know so twitter you don't always know everybody as well so no. you don't always know if they can be you know if you know them a little yeah you might know they are being sarcastic or they are yeah. be you know or they are having a bad day just let them be but um this is easier for me to do and much more fun so um you know I could have talked uh, hours for you, but you know, oh, storm is coming, yeah, so yeah, yeah, probably yeah. you won't hear me anymore in a few minutes. <laughs> but it's also getting late for you, so I don't want to keep you up too late. Well, anyways, thank you very yeah. much. Yes. Thanks everyone for listening. I'll be back. <laughs>